there's nothing wrong with asking the question, well, how do you know that? What is the evidence? What is the basis for that? But what groups like the tobacco and the fossil fuel industry have done is to generate a corrosive skepticism, a skepticism that makes people not just ask reasonable questions, but just reject science categorically. And so you see how tricky this is because it's not a lie. They don't have to lie in order to confuse us. So it's not really based on lying, it's based on confusion. Hi, I'm Naomi Oreskes. I'm the Henry Charles Lee Professor of the History of Science at Harvard University and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences. One of the sad things about the period we live in now is that there are people there who, people out there, people in the world, who are deliberately trying to foment distrust in science. And they do this primarily by raising doubt. Uh, my most well-known book is called Merchants of Doubt. They sell doubt about science in order to undermine public trust in science. So why did they do that? Well, usually for one of two reasons. They either have an economic interest, so scientists maybe have demonstrated the harms of a commercial product, like tobacco or fossil fuels, or they have a political or ideological interest. Uh, they believe in free market economics, and they worry that if climate change is real, we're going to have to regulate the marketplace for fossil fuels. And so in our work, we've looked at both, and we've studied how organizations ranging from the tobacco industry, the fossil fuel industry, uh, but also right-wing libertarian think tanks like the Cato Institute in the United States, um, how they deliberately foment distrust in science. And one of the really sad things about the present period is that they've succeeded. So there are plenty of good reasons why we might be skeptical of any particular scientific claim. People should have a, cert a certain degree of healthy skepticism about particular scientific claims. So there's nothing wrong with asking the question, well, how do you know that? What is the evidence? What is the basis for that? But what groups like the tobacco and the fossil fuel industry have done is to generate a corrosive skepticism, a skepticism that makes people not just ask reasonable questions, but just reject science categorically. And that puts public health, public safety, and the environment at, at serious risk. The most well-studied example of doubt mongering comes from the tobacco industry. We now have many years of research on this. There have been many lawsuits through which documents have become available that really prove what the tobacco industry did and why they did it, so we don't have to speculate. And so one of the key strategies they use is to challenge the causal relations. So for example, it's very, very, very well established now, and virtually all people know it, that smoking causes cancer. It also causes about a hundred other different horrible diseases. But for the longest time, the tobacco industry would challenge that by saying, well, we don't really know for sure because you know, there are other things that cause cancer too. For example, asbestos causes cancer. Radon exposure causes cancer. And so you see how tricky this is because it's not a lie. They don't have to lie in order to confuse us. So it's not really based on lying, it's based on confusion. The fossil fuel industry is still current, and uh, it's a really important example because climate change is one of the most serious threats we face in the world today. We know the scientific evidence is overwhelming, and scientists predicted this, that the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased dramatically, about 40% since the Industrial Revolution, and we know that's changed the climate system in ways that are damaging people around the globe, making heat waves worse, making flood events worse, uh, intensifying hurricanes and cyclones and other tropical storms, and people are being hurt, properties are being damaged, people are being killed. So this is an extremely serious problem that we all need to face together, but the fossil fuel industry continues to say, well, we don't really know, it might be natural variability. So it's exactly the same strategy as the tobacco industry used. How do we know it's fossil fuels? How do we know it's carbon dioxide? Now, of course, the answer is we know because we've built models that test what the world looks like with and without uh, the burning of fossil fuels. We can show that many of the heat waves that are happening now could not have happened had the amount of energy in the system not been increased by fossil fuels. We know it's not natural variability of the sun because we have direct measurements of solar radiation. So we actually have many good lines of evidence that tell us, yes, this is burning fossil fuels, but the industry continues to cast doubt on that. And they also they cast doubt on the alternatives. They say, oh, renewable energy, it's too expensive, it's not reliable enough, it's too intermittent. But of course, 
it could, it could be reliable enough if we had enough of it. The distrust in science is quite closely linked to distrust in government, and that's one of the reasons this is such a difficult issue, because of course, sometimes we're right to distrust our government, uh, and a lot of science in the modern world is tied to government. Uh, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in many parts of Europe, and in China, the vast majority of science is funded through the public purse, through government. So people are right to ask questions. It's never wrong to ask a question, but it is wrong to refuse to accept the answer. And the scientific community has done so much work to demonstrate the reality of climate change, the efficacy of masks, the safety of most vaccines, not all, but most. Um, so, so why do we still have this gap? And one of the reasons we have the gap is because scientists have not done enough to talk to people, to get out of their laboratories, to get out of uh, their ivory towers, and to, to be there with people to talk about our work and to answer people's questions. I wrote a book called Why Trust Science? And part of the reason I wrote that book was because I was giving a public talk uh, in the United States, in the heartland, and um, I was doing a lot of work explaining climate science and all the hard work that scientists had done to bring us to this moment where we really do understand what's happening in the climate system in a pretty robust way. And a man stood up and he said, well, that's all very well and good, but why should we trust the science? And I thought, oh, that's a good question, <laughs> right? So I think that a lot of scientists have taken it for granted that people know why they should trust science. I think a lot of scientists have taken it for granted that science is a public good and that people know that and therefore it should be obvious. But I think one of the things we've learned in recent decades is that it's not obvious. We have to explain it. We have to do more work to explain to people not just what we know, but how we know it. Now, the other part of it though that is very hard is it's not a level playing field. The amount of money that goes into disinformation is massively greater than the amount of money that goes into explaining information. So I do think that scientific institutions have to recognize that you have to put some money into this. I've worked in many institutions in my life that are great institutions that produce great knowledge, but if you ask them to spend money on communication, then they say, oh, that's not our job, that's someone else's job, except it isn't actually anyone else's job. You look around and you think, okay, well, who else is doing this? And then you realize, first of all, no one else is doing it, and no one else really can because scientists have to explain science because we're the ones who understand it. Well, there isn't necessarily a key difference. It really depends on the, per the situation. So we certainly have many times in the past where private organizations have funded science very effectively. In the early 20th century in the United States, most science was not funded by the US federal government. It was funded either by the states by private philanthropists, groups like the Rockefeller Foundation, or private sector. So in the early 20th century, a tremendous amount of important scientific work was done in industrial research labs at big companies like Westinghouse or General Electric in the United States, or some of the big chemical companies in Germany. But the problem with relying on the private sector is that there are many things that the private sector either can't or won't do. And particularly in the modern world where there's a lot of pressure on corporations to report quarterly profits. Science typically is a long-term investment. It can take a long time, a decade, two decades, three decades, to sort out big scientific questions. And so most private sector actors, they just won't do that because there's no short-term profit in it. And that's where the public sector comes in. The public sector is able to make the long-term commitment to scientific research, to build and sustain scientific capacity so that we have it when we need it. And we really saw that during COVID because uh, both here in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and in the United States, vaccines were developed quite rapidly. And a lot of that work was done in the private sector, companies like Pfizer and Moderna, but they were able to do it because they were building on decades of publicly funded basic science. And if we hadn't had that foundation of basic science funded by the public purse, we would not have, the private sector actors would not have been able to achieve what they did. There's also an awful lot of science that makes the world a better place, helps us understand our place in the universe, but doesn't necessarily yield a product that you can sell at a profit, at least not 
in the next few weeks or months or years. So that's where the public funding is so important, that it's complementary to the private sector. This isn't an argument against the private sector. It's an argument for the fact that there are just many things that the private sector doesn't doesn't provide adequately. I mean, my most recent book, The Big Myth, is all about this, that the private sector is very effective at doing certain kinds of things, but completely ineffective at doing other kinds of things. And so that's why you need to have both. And the other thing that's really important about the, the public sector is the way it's able to build capacity. So when we invest in science education, when we invest in universities, when we pay for postgraduate students and postdocs and assistant professors, when we pay their salaries, we're building scientific capacity and scientific infrastructure. You know, if you think about the COVID pandemic, if we had decided, if we didn't have the whole infrastructure of science and decided, oh, we have to only now train microbiologists and train virologists and train immunologists, that would have been a completely hopeless project. And the analogy I like to think to use is to compare it to the military. I mean, we could argue about how much military preparedness we need and how many aircraft carriers and how many bombers and things like that. But, you know, the vast majority of people would acknowledge that in the reality of the world as it is, countries need to have military defenses. No one would say, oh, don't build an aircraft carrier because we'll just build it when we need it. Because we would know that if we were invaded, you can't just build an aircraft carrier overnight. We would know that you can't just train troops overnight. And we have the experience of history that proves to us why when it comes to the military, we have to be prepared. But it's the same with science. When things happen, like a pandemic, you need to have that capacity in place. You can't just suddenly say, oh, now that we need it, we'll do it. It doesn't work that way. So regulation isn't really a question about science, it's really a question about markets. So one of the things we know in the modern world is that markets fail, and when they fail, you need some kind of intervention from outside the marketplace. And that could be a consumer intervention, but in most cases, it's a government intervention. So climate change is the obvious case in point. Uh, we buy fossil fuels, we put petrol in our cars, but we don't really pay the true cost of those products because those products are causing huge amounts of damage, trillions of dollars in damage. Um, that's what economists will say, externalized. So they, you know, that, the, that damage doesn't show up in the price we pay. Governments have to step in in order to remedy the market fail, failure and protect consumers, workers, the natural environment, biodiversity, whatever it is. The way that science gets involved in this conversation is that it's science that's proving the external costs. And this is something that I think a lot of people miss. You know, when you think about climate change as an external cost, it wasn't economists who said, oh, we have a problem here. It was scientists. So it's scientists, natural scientists, who figured that out. And so scientists became the target of attack by people who opposed regulating fossil fuels. And some of those people opposed it out of pure greed but others opposed it out of some idea that government regulation in the marketplace isn't a good idea. And I understand that argument. And clearly, to the extent that it works to let the private sector function without a lot of government bureaucracy, then of course, I think almost everybody would say, sure, we would like that as much as possible. But when we know that private sector activities, commercial activity is doing damage, then this is a real problem. And so science comes in as a kind of reality check a kind of ground truth that yes, this damage is real and we know what's causing it and so we have to address that cause. And in many cases that does mean the government has to become involved in the marketplace to do something to remedy the market failure. So one of the arguments that people sometimes make, people who are uh, leery of government regulation is that they say it's a denial of freedom. And in our work, we've shown how this argument has been weaponized against science to say, oh no, if you regulate the marketplace, if you re regulate fossil fuels, if you regulate tobacco, if you put a price on carbon, you're taking away my freedom. And this has been used to frighten people, to make people afraid of something like a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. And this is really pernicious. And it's pernicious for two reasons. First of all, if we don't fix these problems, we will lose our freedom in many other ways. So imagine your house burning down and everything you owned being destroyed, which is what happened to people in California this past year. I mean, that's a very weird kind of 
conception of freedom to think that you're now, it's okay because I'm free. No, it's not okay. You've been incredibly badly hurt. And also it's a really mistaken conception of freedom because of course my freedom to live the life I want has, is, comes, runs up against the limits of libertarianism when my freedom hurts someone else. So we would never say that you have the freedom to kill someone, right? Murder is illegal. We don't say you have the freedom to steal someone else's property. You say, no, that's their property. And yet somehow people are trying to say we have the freedom to burn fossil fuels, dump carbon pollution in the atmosphere, even though in the end it is stealing from other people who are now losing their property. And it could in some cases even be murder when those people's you know, if those people are killed in a flood or a wildfire. So society, civil society has always understood the notion of competing freedoms. There's a famous line that we sometimes use in America, uh, my freedom to throw a punch ends just before your nose, right? I mean, I don't have the freedom to just do anything I want. What I want to do has to be balanced against the common good and the general welfare. And every government in the world has always recognized that, you know, the preamble to the U.S. Constitution says in order to provide for the general welfare, but I feel like we've somehow lost this notion of the general wel welfare, and we've lost it in part because industries like the fossil fuel industry, like the tobacco industry, and their allies have tried to make us think that we shouldn't care about the general welfare, we should just care about our own personal um, interests, and that's hugely damaging. It flies in the face of the entire history of democratic society. And it's not even what Adam Smith said, and that might be my next book. <laughs>